So talking about barriers and opportunities in primary healthcare today, just to finish off the semester's content for the lectures anyway. Um, so yesterday we talked about the scope of primary healthcare, what it is, uh, where it sits in, in the system overall, and who remembers what the main component of primary healthcare is? GPs. Okay, so today we're looking at, um, and, and I suppose this is around or relevant to what you've been talking about with, um, with, with your project as well, looking at some of the determinants of healthcare because people who have barriers to primary healthcare are often people who face uh, barriers in all sorts of other ways as well to, to, to getting good healthcare across the board. So, just to kick off, um, reviewing the Declaration of Almorata that we talked about yesterday. Integral part of a country's health system and also of the overall social and economic development of the community. And given that, given that primary healthcare is so important, it's interesting that there are so many groups that have trouble accessing it, uh, even in a country. And look, frankly, Australia do pretty well. Our healthcare system is, um, is not bad. Even uh, Donald Trump's complimented it recently. Thank you, sir. There is an acknowledgement. Oh, people coming out of the woodwork. Um, there's an acknowledgement in primary health care that health is a social thing. And that we need to um, take a view of health that acknowledges the importance of the society in which it's located. Individuals need self-reliance, need to, need to have that promoted to them and communities need to have control over the conditions that determine their health. And that's all, not always the case. And a big part of what we're doing this morning is looking at ways in which communities don't have control over the conditions that determine their health. Right? And you should be able to join the dots back to, you, back to your assignment in one way or another, um, looking at, at groups that, for one, one reason or another, need some health promotion work done with them. Okay. It's about dealing with health issues. It's also about um, providing services at, um, in, in and of itself. Number of different services involved. So this is this is sort of revision from yesterday. The aims. This is community for you guys. This is an important point. Working proactively with marginalised, vulnerable, and high risk groups. Because that's essentially what we're looking at today. As far as nurses are concerned, we need to understand what, what goes on in primary health care. We need to participate in primary health care. And in relation to the disadvantaged groups involved, this is really what the rest of the lecture is going to be about. If you want to read this slide, take a photo of it, you can probably go. Because we know. No. Um, so these are the main groups that have some form of disadvantage in terms of their ability to access or control conditions around the health. All right. People from low socioeconomic backgrounds, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, homeless people, people in rural and remote areas, people with mental health problems, 
people with drug and alcohol problems. And there's a couple of others around here. Just um, who's done their assignment targeting one one or more of those groups? Yeah, no surprise there. What about those groups? Prisoners, refugees, and asylum seekers, victims of domestic violence, people living with a disability, the elderly, and caregivers. Yeah. You, 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 you. Homeless victims of domestic violence. Wow, that's specific. Okay, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that. Okay. So there's, there's a few groups involved there. Uh, and one of the things you'll notice about both of those lists, it's a two slide list, um, is that these are people that don't have much of a voice commonly. Maybe, maybe this group, you could, you could argue, have, have a better voice. Um, but a lot of them don't have a lot of advocacy goes on on their behalf that's very effective. Okay, some of the barriers. Why do primary healthcare services not get used? The services are not available or they're limited. That's the first thing. Second thing is the services are available but they're not utilised for some reason. And there's all sorts of reasons why people don't use services. Some of the barriers to using services, three main levels of, of those types of barriers. So there's patient factors, practitioner factors, and factors to do with the organisation or the system itself. And I hope you're not thinking at this point, I wish we'd had this lecture three weeks ago. Because it is, it is sort of relevant to, to what you've been writing about, but also, hopefully, there's, there's an element of revision um, and confirmation that you've been on the right track the last few weeks as you've been working on this for the last few hours. Okay, so here's some patient level issues. Somebody might not be aware of the services, waiting times, costs, transport, opening hours are limited. Um, having a structured appointment system that doesn't suit A number of patient level issues. From the practitioner side, issues around security, and we'll unpack these in relation to each of these groups in a minute. Time restraints, do they have the skills or experience to deal with the issues? Is there a sense of discrimination towards a particular group? Believe it or not, that still happens. Um, Complex needs, it's, it still gets in the way in, in, in some cases. Um, and then is there a lack of, of services in the local area? Is, is this an area of workforce shortage? Do we need a 457 visa um, put in, you know, put in for, for this particular spot? Um, is the service delivery flexible enough? We've talked about integration of services, or do, 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 some, do somehow the services not mesh with the needs of the community? So that's that, that's that list again. We'll unpack that. Low socioeconomic status. Here are some of the issues getting in the way of people from a low socioeconomic status accessing primary health care. Being in that group or having that status in itself underpins and exacerbates disadvantage. So, and being part of a particular group, a particular health related group, may contribute to being in a low socioeconomic status. You think of examples of that. Some of those others. So if you're 
in one of these other groups, you're more likely to be in, in this group. Okay, so this, the, the, these things snowball. Overall, people from socioeconomically disadvantaged groups have higher use of primary healthcare services but receive shorter consultation times. Despite the fact that there's more complexity in that group, or in those groups. And, and some of the barriers, well, a couple of the major barriers, is any cost involved in accessing the services decreases access. So as soon as you put a cost on of any kind, access suffers because these guys are living on the edge. They don't have any margin at all. Um, so if you've, got, if you've got to take a bus, you've got to pay for the bus, um, you've, got to, you've got to spend time, I mean, these people might be time poor. Low socioeconomic areas are also commonly regions of low GP supply for a number of reasons. Um, so that, that, tends to, that factor tends to exacerbate the first one. That if you've got to travel further, it's gonna cost you more than time or money for both to get to the service that you need. Some solutions in relation to that. Acknowledging that health is an issue um, in government portfolios where you may not consider health to be relevant or it may not be immediately obvious where the relevance is. Providing incentives to providers to move into, and, and we've seen this, say, with, with the rural thing, we'll, we'll come to rural issues in, in a minute. Um, but delivering care to lower socioeconomic groups that have complex chronic conditions. Um, it's not very sexy for a medical, you know, ambitious specialist going into the rest of their career to say, okay, I'm going to work with poor people that have, co have complex chronic conditions. Um, some people go there, but a lot of people want to go into cardiology, um, you know, where the money is. And on one level, you can't blame them. Um, taking a multidisciplinary integrated care approach. You, you see a lot of uh, instances in, in the bush and also in, uh, in poorer regions where you're not just a nurse. You're doing much more for your clients than you would be doing if you were working in um, a better resourced service. So if you're working in the bush or you work, you're working in a, you know, low socioeconomic area, um, you might be the social worker, you might be the OT, you might be the psychologist, at least filling that role because there is no one of those things. So everybody has to do a little bit of everything. And that's one, that's one way through. So you create a bit of a one-stop shop that wherever you go, you can get whatever you need. Hopefully. Indigenous groups. Probably one of the largest groups experiencing public health care, primary health care um, disadvantage in Australia. I mean, the numbers are just appalling. You look at uh, just about any measure. Um, you, 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 there's been things in the news recently and all the time about things like life expectancy and chronic diseases and infant mortality and the list just goes on and on. Um, and often it's, it's easy to think, look, this is just what you are. We, we can't actually fix this. We can't change much about this. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And there's, there's almost a sense of not a perfect storm, but, but a number of factors coming together to make it really difficult to, for, for this group or this population to, um, to overcome their disadvantage. They, they're very commonly in a low, lower SES group, often living in rural and remote areas, which complicates things. And there's high rates of disability, homelessness, AOD problems and mental illness. Um, and you put all of those things together in one population, uh, you've got a very difficult group to work with. Very challenging. Um, and there's, there's a lot of turnover of services, of funding. One of, one of, the, one of the issues is around um, the lack of recurrent funding. Um, that things are, projects are funded for a number of years and then the funding expires and has to be reapplied for. A lot of, a lot of the hospitalisation is for conditions that could be prevented, which get, makes people tear their hair out. <laughs> you see, you know, this is not necessary. This is not something that is unavoidable. So why are we not avoiding it? I mean, some of the things that, that are hospitalising Indigenous young people um, are things that in, in the cities we just shrug off. You know, you know, maybe take a day off work, maybe not. Maybe they just take a pen a day. People who are older, dental health is, is really bad. COPD or COAD and diabetes, major health problems. Um, those last two, fairly major in, um, in the non-Indigenous population, but in the Indigenous population, they're endemic almost. And as I said, you've got multiple risk factors. Um, A lot of that, a lot of poor health behaviours going on. Maybe a lot of poor health beliefs going on. Um, I heard the other day that um, a um, what's what's the word? Sort of an old wives' remedy for helping a child settle in um, in in bush, in bush communities when when um, when a child was breastfeeding was to put petrol on the nipple to help them settle down. And that's commonly done. Now, you don't turn a behaviour around when that's, when that's sort of become just, well, that's what you do. We haven't really given it a lot of thought, but, you know, I... My mum told me to do this, my grandmother did this, and this, go, this goes way back. Um, you don't turn that around simply with an education camp. But those sort of behaviours combined with the fact that chronically dis- chronic diseases have been poorly managed and care is poorly coordinated means that overall, the health status um, remains poor and the need for primary healthcare services remains frequent. Despite the fact that the service is not adequate. Okay, so any, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna guarantee this, but, any, but um, but any, um, any assignment that, that wrote about a target group of Indigenous Australians was, was, is probably going to do pretty well because there's so much material out there. And the, and the trick with, I suppose, any academic piece of writing is sticking close to your sources. You know, don't, don't sort of speculate beyond what you've got references to back up. Yeah, we're good with that. 
Okay. Some more barriers. Under identification of indigenous status in the in the care setting. Um, and this is this is increasing. Um, the number of people who are identifying as indigenous now is increasing um, because the people are finding out more about their history and joining the dots about why they felt disconnected from society for so long and what's going on for me and something that's fallen into place is that they've discovered some indigenous heritage that they didn't know they had. Um, now, that can be a double-edged sword because if somebody's identifying as indigenous um, and wanting to reconnect with country, for example, um, and the healthcare system is not geared towards gathering that information, then people are not going to be receiving appropriate care. There's costs involved related to co-payments. So what's the co-payment? Who knows what a co-payment is? So you go to you go to a consultant, um, you go anywhere, you go to a GP. A co-payment is a gap. The gap looks like a gap payment, so it's not fully bulk billed. Yeah. Um, so there's costs in relation to getting prescriptions filled and other indirect costs like transport and opportunity costs like the time involved. Well, if you're in a remote area, um, it might take you a day to get to a service provider and then another day to get back. So that's about geographical access. Not feeling culturally safe in the care environment. Um, number of cultural differences. We've got a, in third year, we, you, you have a, uh, a guest lecturer from, um, who, who's, who's worked extensively in, uh, in indigenous environments. And um, she, she talks about some of, the, um, some of the cultural safety issues that are really quite surprising to non-indigenous caregivers that they don't realise um, the business as usual is culturally threatening to people who have had you know, generations of, of disadvantage and discrimination. All right, a lot of administrative costs. And you would have, you've heard the, the, the discussions about, you know, keep cutting red tape and keeping administrative costs low that in theory free up money for actual service delivery, actual work at the coalface. And gaps between services, that silo idea that people in different sectors don't talk to each other the way that, the way that they should. Um, So the example given is between mainstream services and community controlled sectors. So the indigenous community themselves running programs, but not being in good communication and not having good communication from the state run or the federal health departments. Some ways through this. Working on increasing cultural safety, you'll, you'll, you'll do in services, you'll do professional development on cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, cultural competence. That's a continuum. Okay, you become culturally aware, you develop cultural sensitivity, and you become culturally competent over time. Doesn't happen overnight. Um, but we're getting better at that. Um, some, some services still do it better than others. We need to increase the rates of identifying that somebody is from an Indigenous background um, and not just taking it for granted or not just going by the appearance of the person but asking the question, do you identify as? Making sure that collaboration 
between mainstream and community controlled sectors happens whenever possible. Streamlining reporting processes. This is a key one. And there's been a lot of work done getting Indigenous people into healthcare provider positions, um, providing incentives for that. Uh, and it, it's really interesting. If you look at um, what's happening in youth detention in the Northern Territory, for example, you might think that's not healthcare, yes, it is. There's health issues, there's health issues, there's health implications around that. Very few Indigenous people working in youth detention. Why is that? And that's one of the things that needs to be turned around. And of course, over, overcoming logistical barriers, those, um, those cost issues that, that get in the way. Homeless people. On any one night in Australia, we have over 100,000 people who are homeless. That is not necessarily people who are sleeping rough. These are people who have unstable accommodation, who maybe have a, have a place to sleep tonight, but aren't sure where they're sleeping tomorrow night. You can look at homelessness on a continuum, from sleeping rough down one end to stable accommodation at the other end and everywhere in between. Once again, you've got complications. You've got multi-factorial issues that these people are dealing with. They're poor, tend to be. High rates of mental illness and substance abuse, and they tend to have more contact with the criminal justice system. Now, correlation does not equal causation. I think I've mentioned that. Um, so we're not saying that homelessness or any of these comes before or after any of the others. There's multi-directional relations between these, these, these issues. But you can see instances where all directions apply. So if you're homeless, you're more likely to fall into one of these groups. And if you're in one of these groups, you're at a greater risk of being homeless. There's still, um, it's still the case that hospitalisation for avoidable conditions happens because of the unstable accommodation, despite the fact that that homeless people often have people who they see regularly and are aware of their history. These are, again, complex cases. High rates of a lot of chronic conditions, substance abuse, mental illness, HIV AIDS. And there's been a, um, a particular push for early intervention for mental illnesses. Um, because we've noticed that leaving those till the more severe and more established problems um, complicates the picture and makes problems more difficult to deal with later on. So the principal barriers. Medication schedule. What's a medication schedule? No, quite, not, not quite. Medication schedule is some medications are available over the counter, some medications are only from a pharmacy, some only by prescription. Okay, and then you have Schedule Eight drugs, which are the um, dangerous drugs, poisons. Okay, they need to be need to be careful, carefully administered. Um, and then you have your S11s, which is a different schedule altogether. We won't go there. 
appointment-based systems. Why do you think appointment-based systems might be a problem for homeless people? Yeah, so you might, um, you might say, yeah, we, I can fix you in six weeks. Um, homeless person doesn't know if they're going to be in the neighbourhood in six weeks because they don't know where their accommodation is going to be. They might be sleeping that night on the other side of town because it's where they could find a bed. Once again, transport. Has anybody, has anybody done their assignment on public transport? Or incorporating public transport or some sort of transport solution? I know, I know there have been a couple. A friend of you? Yeah, cool. Nice. Um, because it is, it, is, it, is, it is critical. If you can't get to a health service provider, um, most people don't make house calls in. Stigmatisation, poor relationships with healthcare providers. Um, you know, that, that, that whole thing about trailer trash, that, that, that's sort of, that's sort of not, not here so much, but the idea that you don't have a place to live, what do you mean you don't have a roof over your head? I talked to a school principal once um, who had a, had a child in his school and he said, look, well, I'm really worried because I don't know where he goes at night. He comes, out, he comes in the morning. Uh, I think he's in the same clothes pretty much all the time, but I don't know where he sleeps at night. Um, so, I mean, you know, young people can be pretty resilient and you know, still come to school on a daily basis, despite the fact that their home life is you know, spinning out of control. But stigmatisation is, is, uh, is, is a big barrier to, to good health care. Some solutions, some relation to homeless people. So some places, I mean, in, in, in mental health, we have um, homeless teams. And it's not that the teams are homeless, but they're outreach teams. They actually go looking for people um, in places where they've got a good sense that they, that they will be. Um, some charities have homeless outreach people, um, groups that go out and support people who are sleeping rough. Um, I think Brother Wilson Lawrence is one that goes around in the city and, and the bits and pieces around that. Um, but particularly for people who have come out of institutionalised care or come out of a period of, of, of inpatient care and maybe are going back into an unstable accommodation situation that contributed to their need for hospitalisation in the first place. Social support, so personal helpers, mentors, um, you don't think, I mean, things like Big Brother, Big Sister programs, who are those? Um, just, just setting in place, or even, uh, what, what's the one um, in schools, um, Kids Hope? You know, just giving people somebody to talk to can be the difference between having absolutely nobody and having somebody. Being more flexible, because um, we've talked about things like appointment times and you know, no, saying, no, you can't have that because you don't meet the requirements and sort of being, I suppose, less bureaucratic about, about the way services are delivered. Intermediate care options that are less acute. So step up, step down programs. So maybe respite care is an example of that. Short term options. People in the bush. About two and a half million people when I wrote this. Um, probably less now, um, um, in rural or remote areas. There's a pattern in Australia 
and in other countries as well, but we're talking about Australia, uh, of inadequate healthcare in rural and remote areas, including, once again, and there's a lot of overlap between a lot of these, a lot of these factors, as, you, as you'll notice. High rates of hospitalisation for conditions that are preventable, low levels of continuity of care, because we in in rural and remote areas they don't have a lot of staff on the ground. You might have fly in, fly out people. Doctors do fly in, fly out, and nurses do fly in, fly out. Um, agencies. You know, do appointments in places in you know outback towns um, and advertise in the city. You want you want a holiday in the country? Get in touch with the nursing agency, and I'll send you there. Once again, poor dental outcomes, ear, nose, and throat conditions. Conditions that are preventable by vaccines. So a similar picture to what we've seen in 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 relation to other groups. So specific barriers. Services are poorly integrated. Workforce shortages. Restrictive funding now. If you fund a rural service the way, the same way that you that you fund a an urban service, one of the problems that you're going to come up against is distance. That you can't do as much in a day because you're not spending ten minutes to get to an appointment. You're spending an hour or an hour and a half, and that time on the road is dead time where there's no. There's no bang for your buck happening. And once again, this overlap between one factor and another. Some ways through this, some things that um, health promotion could focus on. Increased flexibility of services. Clarifying what we want to achieve, how we're going to do it. Once again, there is there are, have been and continue to be initiatives. I think they're talking about a new medical school in the Orange, I think, Western New South Wales somewhere. Um, particularly looking at the healthcare workforce needs in rural and remote areas. And using new technologies like telehealth and telemedicine, so they're not even that new anymore, um, but they're still being rolled out and not being utilised to the uh, to the fullness of their potential. Mental health, my specialty, leading cause of disability burden, so almost a quarter of the total years lost due to disability. Remember dailies from a few weeks ago? Comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. I wrote a paper a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, called um, GPs, the missing link in the service system in relation to comorbid conditions because a lot of GPs at the time were very poor at picking up comorbid issues. Comorbid substance abuse with mental illness accounts for approximately 30% of mental health related disability. And compared to all other health conditions, the leading cause of, of disability is depression. P 
people whose prevalence of mental illness is highest are the least likely to access services. This is a problem. Two thirds of people who have used services for a mental health condition have, are not satisfied with their, with their outcomes. This is not an easy area to work in. But it's not, it's not some, something that suits everybody. And if you've got complicating factors, so if you've got comorbid physical problems, if you've got acute suicidality, rural and remote again, and prisoners that we'll come to, um, that complicates the situation even further. Some specific barriers. People themselves and healthcare providers not understanding or not being aware of what's going on. This is why it's in this course. Because you need to know about it, even if you're not working in the specialty. And there's all sorts of stigma and marginalisation that goes on in, in relation to, uh, to mental disorders. Some ways through. Strategies to improve wellness, not just dealing with illness, but improving wellness. And primary healthcare has a big role in there. Amazing what you can do with telehealth. Actually, recently, it's, it's interesting, um, there's been more and more around um, phone apps and what, what can be done around that. And the, I think the jury's very much still out on whether they're actually helpful, but I'm yet to see anything that suggests that they're harmful. That's an interesting debate. Upskilling generalist staff to respond to mental health emergencies. So at the end of first semester for second years, there's a mental health first aid program that we run as a sort of a bit of a primer. So that's available to you uh, halfway through next year, or this time next year. Um, It's not mandatory for GPs, really, to, um, to do anything that, that, that doesn't strike them as something that, that, that they want to do. Um, but there is increasing pressure for, uh, for GPs to get good at mental health care provision. And there is the Mental Health Nurse Incentive Program that co-locates mental health nurses in GP surgeries so they can deal with low acuity issues and then refer on as required. Okay. Drug and alcohol users. Our AOD means alcohol and other drug. Um, the disadvantages in relation to treatment for the for adverse effects from alcohol and other drug use are more pronounced if you if you are homeless or and if you're an indigenous you're less likely to get into a detox or a rehab um, if you're in one of those two groups in particular There is still a sense that if you have a substance use issue, what other issues you have tend to get, not minimalised, but papered over. Let's just say that. And that over time deters 
people's access makes them less likely to seek help because they've been told one too many times your problem is drug use, sort out your drug problems and other problems will, will, will sort themselves out as well. And a lot of the time that's not true. Somebody might have chronic pain, that's why they're, um, what, that's why they have a, a substance use issue. Um, but the service, the system um, doesn't respond to their need for chronic pain or they're hard to deal with because chronic pain is difficult to deal with. Um, and if you like, part of putting somebody in the too hard basket can often involve saying, well, their problem is drug use, there's nothing we can do about that here. It's not our area. Part of that discrimination is that people are not skilled or experienced. Um, they don't know what to do. Now, if you've got somebody in a healthcare environment and, they're, and it's a controlled environment, then the reality is that they're probably detoxing while they're with you. And if, if, if that's a medically or physically risky detox that they're going through, you need to know how to deal with that. Because there's going to be all sorts of complications that you need to be aware of and potentially manage. Like, for example, risk of seizures. We're not going to go into withdrawal syndromes now. There are structural issues that are not conducive to a, to a dependent user's way of life. Okay, so, so once again, if you've got an appointment in six weeks time, um, some people's lifestyles can be best characterized as chaotic. And they don't know. You know, they may have a really good memory, but not that good. So that can be a real barrier. Some solutions, services that are available immediately. So 24 hour, this is, this is one of the arguments behind things like needle syringe programs, behind things like safe injecting rooms, um, that people can go to a service and get the service they need when they need it. So viable alternatives to having to make an appointment and come back at a time when it suits the provider. Suitable convenient locations, hours of operation, 24 hour. Value free advice and support. You see a lot of recovered users involved in this area and people who go into healthcare out of a background of drug and alcohol use, not uncommonly go into, into this field. A harm minimization approach, we'll hear a bit more about in the second year. Essentially that's something that doesn't focus on giving, it, giving things up entirely, but acknowledges that, okay, this is not gonna stop. How do we minimize the harm? And there's, there's no other strategies in that. Once again, upskilling, joint management and integration are all important. Prisoners. Not far, son. How are we going? Cool. Overrepresentation of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. We've met them before. So this complicates the picture. Approximately half of all prisoners in custody have two or more characteristics of serious disadvantage, including some of these ones that we have already seen. I haven't seen that one yet. Number of health conditions, particularly problematic uh, with prisoners.
The last one might surprise you. Why would why would that be a why would that be a, a problematic concern? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Because if the healthcare services are not adequate in prison, if they're not geared, do you think there's many midwives working in prison? No. I think there's much maternal child health goes on in, in even in women's prisons. No. So the healthcare service is not geared to working with the prisoner population. A lot of smoking still in, in, in prison populations. Um, if somebody is an injecting drug user, there's a greater likelihood that it's going to be done in a non-sterile way. And in fact, some of the biggest um, benefits they've had from needle syringe programs, that is needle exchange, has been in, in prisons um, because there's a lower barrier to acceptance of that amongst the staff because they're received often and they're just grateful for whatever help they can get. Um, lack of condom availability, other safe, safe sex options and higher prevalence of mental health problems, which you could argue also goes to the territory. If you're in a if you're in a um, custodial situation, then then the chance of somebody's depression or anxiety or other issues coming out um, are they some ways through. Prisoners' reasons for not accessing services are again tend to be related to. Things like cost and the requirement to make an appointment and the opportunity cost, the, the lifestyle complication that needs to be worked through for them to navigate that. Now, moving from prison to out of prison, it's even more complicated because in prison, everything's done for you and everything's regimented and the lights get turned on and off for you, meals get brought to you, you're told when you can go to the toilet, um, everything is decided for you and then you go out of prison and nothing's there, you've got to make your own decisions and it's going from zero to 100 in terms of what's expected of you. You see how that can complicate things and how people sometimes feel more, more comfortable in prison and will sometimes deliberately re-offend to get back into that place where they feel looked after, where they feel safer in some cases. Domestic violence. Approximately. Um, how, you, how do you define it? What's the reporting like? We're not just talking about physical injuries, we're talking about um, emotional abuse as well. We're talking about chronic health conditions that are not adequately addressed to the point where somebody can develop disability. Some of the key barriers. If you're having a health related issue that's related to domestic violence and you don't want to tell somebody or for some reason the health provider doesn't find out, then they don't know. So lack of disclosure is a real problem in relation to primary health care outcomes. Sometimes people need more time than the provider has. 
to deal with things. Um, privacy is a concern. Confidentiality can be a concern. Again, lack of skills and experience. And frankly, reluctance is about stigma again. People don't want to think about it. People don't want to admit that it might be happening. One key solution, making sure that it's screened for. Making sure that we talk about it, that we have the conversation. And that we don't just talk about what's obvious. We don't just talk about what the person comes and says the problem is. But if we're noticing that there are other things that might be going on, we have that conversation. Um, I nursed a lady years ago, Italian lady. She was in her sixties when I when I saw her, and she was in um, one of the big mental institutions, and had been saying for years that her husband had been abusing her, and they were convinced that she was schizophrenic, and totally delusional, um, and this was the cardinal sign. Um, after she'd been in in the institution non-stop living there essentially for 30 years plus um one of her grandsons i think or nephews um came up to one of the staff quietly one day and said you know her husband beats her up and this was a family like many other families that are very good at keeping secrets the families do keep secrets and it can take a bit of skill sometimes to realise that you're not being told the whole story. So routine screening, it's not always an easy thing, but it's, it's, it's the way through. People with disabilities, uh, interesting thing, I woke up this morning and all of a sudden have a Labor government because they've agreed to fully fund the NDIS. Don't know how that happened. Um, we don't really know enough about what makes good good health outcomes for people with disabilities. That's one of the reasons we need the NDIS. There is a high le higher level of utilisation. And it depends on, on, on what level of, of impairment or limitation there is. Some of the barriers. And these are often to do with um, activities of daily living. So just actually being able to access services. You know, getting on a bus, getting on a tram, um, having having the train stop and the and the driver put out the ramp doesn't always happen, and it makes the news when it doesn't. There are unique needs that people have. Sometimes they need to be particular strategies that need to be put in place because of different ways of people communicating, for example. And a thing called diagnostic overshadowing, where chronic conditions are not recognised as, as such, but are seen as part of the disability. working to communicate better with people. I was reading something the other day, um, signing is not just useful for people with health, with, with, with hearing impairments, but for people with, with other types of communication issues, it can be a useful adjunct, um, rather than just relying on the spoken word, using other, other communication cues to the visual, um, telling stories, 
can be can be useful. Um, real time sources of information, financial incentives. It's a comprehensive health assessment program. As I said, there's also the NDIS now. And dual disability is comorbid mental illness and disability. Um, that's a, a, a particular area of work that, um, that some people don't. The elderly, nearly done. Frequent users of all healthcare services, obviously you may think, but some, but sometimes um, access to primary healthcare is is not great, and it's sometimes the reason why people are in hospital when they actually need to be. Once again, issues of cost, comorbidity, reluctance of GPs to, to visit residential aged care facilities, um, like nursing homes. Um, nursing homes sometimes struggle to get GP coverage. Aged care, again, it's not a terribly sexy area. Um, so getting good providers, good practitioners, people who want to stay and make a career of the, of the specialty um, can, be, can be a challenge. The numbers involved that, 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 um, that involve wait times that can be, that can blow out and the opportunity costs involved in that of course as well. So a lot of the issues that we've already spoken about apply to the elderly. Some solutions. Things that we try to do. Hospital in the home. Few other things that we've already, we've already spoken about in one way or another. Caregivers, the front line of primary care, um, and often the forgotten volunteers in the, in the industry. Um, these are the people that keep people out of hospital until they can't cope anymore. We don't know very much about what primary health care needs caregivers have because most research focuses on the needs of the people receiving care rather than the people that are caring for the people receiving care. But we do know that there are very high levels of depression, anxiety and sleep deprivation. Which I don't think surprises terribly many people. mainly about support for what they do rather than having it done for them. Most people are happy to be carers. They're in a caring role because they've got a relationship with the person and that, that's okay. Um, but they want help to be able to do that. So for example, they might want help with something else that they're letting go, like getting the kids to school because they've got to take their grandma to the appointment or doing the shopping or tidying the house. Other things that you don't necessarily think of as, as health related, but, but they help enormously. Some caregivers don't identify themselves as such. Cost of some services are prohibitive. Um, some people have to give up their jobs to become caregivers uh, or find themselves in a situation where they've got costs that they didn't expect and time demands that they didn't allow for and 
things just have to make massive changes to do what has to be done. A lot of those issues that we've dealt with in relation to some of these other groups. Like I said, there's a lot of overlap. Some ways through, home care support, like I said, some of the day-to-day -day uh, necessities. Respite care. Supporting the needs of elderly caregivers as well. But like I say, it's not always about necessarily doing the caring for a person, not just about providing respite care, but often about helping with the stuff that's not getting done because the caregiving is taking up so much time. And lastly, refugees and asylum seekers. Costs of care that are not covered by Medicare. Um, the fact that these, that this, this population do not have an income, uh, are not allowed to work, not, do not have access to, to mainstream healthcare. So, I mean, asylum seekers certainly, refugees different, because they were actually granted a visa at that point. There's a thing called the primary care amplification model that is about amplifying or making louder the strengths of existing general practices around a beacon practice. And there's some information around that on Brightspace. So you would have a, uh, like a hub practice that's got a particular strength in a particular area and other areas, other services in that region would be um, directed to, to work with, with that hub practice or that beacon practice. All right, that's me. Thanks for the semester. In the tutes, we'll be uh, looking at the, the unit evaluation and I'll, I've got one last little piece to, to throw at you uh, in relation to how we develop uh, good, effective healthcare or health promotion.